Our next talk is going to be delivered by Wojciech Kusi and Matej Bartosz. It will be about processing satellite Im imagery with Python. Awesome. So good afternoon and thank you for those kind words. Um, I would like to welcome you on our presentation of satellite imagery on uh, processing with Python. And together with me, I have Wojta Kusi, who is a software engineer at SpaceNow, and myself, a head of engineering there. And without further ado, I would jump right in. And uh, uh, what we have in here is uh, what we do, basically. And uh, that is that we have built a platform which ingests, searches, and downloads, and analyzes petabytes of satellite imagery. And uh, what uh, we usually do is that we analyze uh, these uh, imagery uh, we are in-house trained neural networks and when we detect some of these objects then we would like to extract an information from that we are the a series of imagery for example to have a economic activity of uh, logistic centers in china because uh, economic activity in china is not very transparent nowadays uh, to uh, uh, brief you on the presentation. We would like to go through a, several topics, and that is what is the satellite imagery, uh, how does it look, and how it works, and some uh, typical applications. And finally, a dem demonstration by Oita. So what is satellite imagery? It's a um, imagery captured by satellites and <laughs> of our planet. And what is remote sensing? Well, sensing is gathering information. Remote is from distant. So in this case, remote is satellites and sensing is our planet. So remote sensing and so it's the same as satellite imagery. And how could you picture a satellite imagery? It's, um, well, a picture or a um, image uh, with a camera or your phone uh, put up in an orbit and with some additional bands and even possibly with some uh, geolocation data and with some resolution possibly, which means uh, how large is the pixel in the image and some azimuth and geolocation. Well, not very helpful so far, right? And uh, in a perfect world, we could have possibly see the image in the middle, which um, I'll just pinpoint in there. It's this one. And that means that for each pixel, we would get a spectra described in the left picture. And that's uh, this one. Uh, so that means that for each wavelength, we would get a value. However, uh, real world kicks in, and we have to sample uh, our data. Uh, so we'll get uh, several images. Uh, that's this one. And, uh, and these images uh, are just samples of our wavelengths. So what, what does that mean is uh, pra uh, it's practically seen in this slide. And it's uh, that we have a sample of a blue band in uh, this part of spectra, a green band in this part of spectra, and red band is this part of spectra. This is uh, bands or uh, sampling on uh, Landsat 7 in the lower part and Landsat 8 in the upper part. And what uh, is this, or what is special about this is uh, that uh, there's a sp uh, special bands and it's this Cirrus band and the aerosol band which uh, are not uh, exactly in the visible spectra and are there just for uh, scientific purposes to um, find out clouds to find out aerosol in the coastal areas. And, um, well, how, how does it work? Uh, it's uh, basically that uh, sun is shining and uh, it's electromagnetic energy. And if we could follow a single particle uh, ray to our planet, uh, then uh, it would absorb the imagery or absorb the uh, energy on some spot on Earth and uh, reflect some of that energy back to the atmosphere where uh, it would uh, be reflected to a satellite which would acquire the energy. And as you've probably noticed in uh, this image, it travels to the atmosphere twice. 
And uh, this is, uh, in, in result, uh, makes the image hazy or cloudy, and uh, it could be compensated for. However, I think it's outside of this presentation currently because it uh, requires uh, some mathematical uh, operations which are not that trivial. Uh, when the satellite sensor was exposed uh, enough and it stores the imagery in a, in a buffer, then it starts to collect a new image. And uh, as you can see, it's a classical camera and thus it uh, has some vignetting problems, it has problems with oversaturation, and uh, therefore uh, there'll be some invalid pixels, it will be uh, skewed and uh, hard to describe. And uh, when it is uh, near a uh, ground station, which is uh, in the image in here, it uh, tr starts to transmit the data Hopefully, it will transmit all the data without any failure, which is not always the truth. And uh, after that, we acquire the data and need to process it, georeference it, and of course, provide it. And uh, well, so far, I've talked about the processes, definitions, and um, other stuff, but can you show me some images? Well, I can, however, what would come to your mind as a typical example is usually a Google Maps. And uh, that's not always the truth because Google Maps is not just satellite data. They create a mosaic of uh, satellite data and aerial photography. And if you zoom in, for example, in Europe, they'll um, show usually aerial photography. And if you zoom in in the uh, Middle East or Asia, then you'll probably have a uh, satellite imagery. So uh, without further ado, here it is. It's Landsat 7, and if you see anything, just wave, please. <laughs> it's uh, located over Bratislava Castle. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> it was launched in 1999, so pretty old by now, and it's planned to be decommissioned. Uh, it's free to use for academic purposes. And as you've probably noticed, uh, there are these uh, diagonal patterns, which I've not added, they are there. And it's because uh, there was a failure of this Landsat 7 scan line corrector in 2003. And uh, nearly a fifth of the data has this pattern, which obscures the imagery. Well, space is hard. However, and NASA wasn't discouraged, and they launched another satellite. And uh, currently, you all probably couldn't see it, but this is Bratislava Castle still. <laughs> They've uh, improved it, added some bands, and um, still non-commercial, free for academic purposes. And what about uh, some other European space agency? Uh, didn't leave the thread dry and launched a on satellites a few years after. And now we can see something, probably, because what they did is they lowered the re resolution now that each pixel has uh, 10 meters. And uh, now we finally can see at least uh, some buildings, some urbanization, probably, and uh, finally the Bratislava Castle. And uh, wow, what is this, right? It's still Bratislava Castle in here. But uh, as I said, the, the uh, part uh, regarding the uh, optical imagery and that the sun is shining, well, uh, for uh, SAR, which is synthetic aperture radar, we could omit that. And uh, the satellite, instead of uh, waiting for the reflection, could uh, beam our planet Earth with, uh, with its energy and wait for the response. And, uh, and the response would be changes in the phase. And uh, so far, well, you could picture it as a bat uh, waiting for the echo signal and uh, just having this in, in mind. Well, uh, positive of this imagery is that you don't need sun, so you can uh, monitor stuff at night. And uh, you could penetrate clouds. And unless you have a very good eye or your bat or a snake, 
then uh, you see stuff like me, which is some sort of postmodern art. And uh, well, now we go to the territory of uh, commercial imagery, and uh, we get down to the resolution of three meters. And uh, well, now we can see at least the buildings, and uh, probably we could extract some footprints and uh, stuff like that. However, it still could be better. And uh, we get to the planet Skysat, which is a company in the US. And uh, they provided us with a sub meter resolution. And uh, now we can probably count even cars in here, uh, count uh, trees or single trees, and extract the footprints of, of, the, uh, of the buildings. And uh, what about some specialties and characteristics of the satellite imagery? Well, it's uh, defined by the position of sun. And uh, sun does um, this nasty thing, which is that it throws shade. And uh, well, uh, it's hard to detect uh, black cars in, uh, in shade. And what about uh, the other stuff, which is location of satellite? Well, uh, it does an another nasty thing, which uh, if I jump two slides back, is uh, that the image is slightly tilted. It could be seen in this Bratislava castle again. And uh, for example, if we do a change analysis, so if we take two optical imagery and uh, we try to uh, find differences in there, well, it could be uh, unhelpful to have uh, images which are just tilted buildings. And this would ruin our uh, change detection potentially. And uh, without uh, having a lot of that issues, there's also as well a cloud coverage. And that is uh, usually everywhere. And um, it's basically, uh, or I'll just tell you that this is allegedly 50% of cloud coverage, and this one is 10% of cloud coverage. Well, uh, providers usually lie, and uh, they provide this uh, percentage over the whole area. And um, it could ruin probably your uh, searching of the catalog because you would just uh, pick a scene which uh, has this way 50% of cloud coverage, and you would get this. So not very good. And what about the state of the remote sensing API? Well, uh, providers allows you to um, search by bounding box and uh, search by some time range parameters. But it's uh, really hard to grab a fixed menu price because uh, it's not very mature industry. And you have to, for example, pay for searching, pay for a kilometer squared for the imagery, pay for megapixels. It's, um, it's a mess. And uh, what about the API? Well, quality of API is faltering because uh, usual target is a customer with a Python notebook or a researcher which does the time series uh, data, but it's not really stable on uh, if we just want to scale it up. And uh, last thing, or fancy thing, that uh, providers now allow you is a position a satellite or area you want to capture. And uh, it's a pretty amazing idea that you would just send a satellite over area you want, and it will take a picture, and uh, you'll have it just in time you want. So what about typical applications? Well. Here we have a city of Amman in Jordan. And uh, what we usually do at, the, at our company is uh, this, is that we try to analyze uh, everything, basically, roads, urbanization, trees, uh, rooftops, cars, and trucks. Well, basically, whatever the resolution allows us. What about other stuff? Well. We have uh, did a analysis over uh, uh, Novozerno, which is uh, near the, uh, which is in uh, Crimea, 
and uh, we have uh, detected early changes in the uh, unused motor pool or airports and uh, said that the uh, amount of uh, land equipment or amount of technique is rising and uh, there should be or there's it's rising which was lately uh, approved by a uh, high um, resolution image which showed that it's really true and uh, there's been uh, more and more technique uh, arriving at the site. And uh, without further ado, again, I would like to give the floor to Wojta, who will show you a demonstration of satellite imagery in Python. So thank you. Okay, uh, so hello, this is the uh, practical part of this, uh, of our talk. And uh, I've prepared uh, this uh, notebook, which I encourage you to um, copy the URL or capture the QR code. And um, it's, it's basically the introduction to satellite imagery processing with the help of, of the basic Python uh, libraries. And um, in the beginning, um, we'll, use, we'll use the Earth engine uh, to, get, to get the uh, satellite imagery. Uh, unfortunately, our, our, our platform is, is uh, not publicly available for this kind of purposes. So uh, we will use uh, the F engine, and we will not use the usual way how the F engine uh, API or how F engine is used because they develop some kind of their custom uh, uh, framework to work with the imagery data. But we will use the REST API, which allows us uh, to switch to uh, to the Python libraries and essentially to the way we are actually doing the processing in our company, company to do the essence, essential essential uh, essential stuff with the with this imagery data so uh, so there are some hidden hidden uh, instructions how to set up and how to authenticate to earth engine uh, uh, that's that's up to you I won't go uh, into this and uh, let's uh, let's start with the with the uh, rest API so there is uh, just some uh, public public address and uh, in, in the authentication part, we get the authentication object through which we will, we will send the request uh, through the rest of, the, of, of this notebook. Uh, as uh, Mati mentioned, uh, when, when, when you are searching through the catalog of the imagery, you usually need some bound, bound, uh, boundary. Uh, in this case, uh, I, I call it the area of interest with the abbreviation of AOI. And in this case, it's... Uh, it's some building around there. Uh, I, I wanted to point to this building, but actually Google is lying. When I, Google was lying when I was preparing this, so it's actually I guess the the building the, the next to this one. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm I'm displaying I'm displaying the point in which is defined in GeoJSON uh, in a volume. There was a nice talk about volume yesterday. Uh, I won't go deeper in the in the volume. This is out of scope of this world, uh, uh, of this talk. I'm just uh, I'm just using it as a as a display widget. Uh, uh, so let's let's move on uh, to the uh, to the first uh, to the first step when we are when we are starting with the uh, processing of some uh, of some uh, satellite imagery. And this is the search, of course. So uh, as we said. Uh, you, you need you need uh, usually some geometry, 
so there, there are some there is some intersection with this uh, with this JSON. Uh, then, uh, then usually want some uh, some period of time. So in this case, we are searching for all the images uh, from the uh, July 1st to uh, to September the 1st. And of course, you don't want uh, uh, the images which are too much, uh, where there's too much cloud cover. So, uh, so we 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 are searching for the uh, for the cloud cover which is which is less than 30 percent. And uh, in this part, we are just sending sending the request with this filter, and uh, in this part, we are just uh, we are just listing what we found in the catalog. And here are the results. So uh, with this filter, we have found uh, those those images. Uh, in the first column is the ID of the image. The second column is the when when the image was captured, and the third column is the cloud coverage. Here we can see that at uh, the July uh, 21, 21st, uh, there, there was actually the zero, net, net zero coverage. It's pretty rare, but let's let's use this image. Uh, uh, at least we don't need to care care about clouds in the in the further processing. So uh, so once we we have this ID, we can explore further what we get. And we can we can ask uh, the APR for just for some metadata about about this image. So uh, so again, let's uh, let's hit the REST API with the asset ID, and let's parse the response and uh, let's look let's dive in what's what's there. And one of the most important part uh, is the description of the of the bands what the image contains. As, as Mate show, shown you, the, the, the bands are bas basically the samples uh, which are captured from the spectrum. It's basically the, the, uh, the data from the particular sensors. And uh, we can see that this data set, it's actually the Copernicus uh, data set from the European Space Agency, has these 13, uh, 13 bands uh, and then uh, some free computed bands. Uh, if we if we print the the B2 uh, band, uh, the, uh, the metadata for this B2 band, it's the blue, it's actually uh, the blue spectrum. Then we see that uh, there is some data type information, so you can uh, so uh, all the data is basically integers with this uh, potential maximum value, and in the grid you can see the um, uh, some georeferencing information. Uh, the important part is the CRS code uh, that's, that tell you in which coordination, uh, coordinate reference system the image will be returned. And so uh, we are we are asking with the uh, we are asking the API with the with the GPS GPS compatible uh, coordinate reference system, but we, we will get the results back in a completely different system. Uh, and uh, the affine transform actually uh, that's basically parameters for the affine transform metrics and it uh, basically defines how each pixel uh, from this raster data is transformed to be uh, georeferenced so in this case uh, this uh, this band has 10 uh, 10 uh, 10 meters resolution so basically the scale x and scale y tell you that each pixel has 10 uh, 10 meters so each pixel will be basically extended to 10 meters, and uh, the translate uh, uh, translate x and translate y uh, tells you how how all, all the thing will be shifted in this in this uh, uh, coordinate reference system. So that's basically the top left corner of the of the image. And uh, an error important part uh, of the metadata is is the geometry. It's basically the uh, the data uh, which you are intersecting with. Uh, if you the, uh, if you are sending some geometry, some bounding box, and in this case uh, we are just in the middle, but that's just an accident. Uh, if we if we were uh, if we are asking for some point around Vienna, for example, then we get the same uh, the same square. And. Uh, the the, uh, the geometry is defined uh, as a geojson uh, with uh, uh, with these coordinates, and you can see you can probably see from, from already from this preview that it's pretty large image. 
uh, if we have, if we get the, uh, if we can calculate the size from the dimensions. So uh, it, it is present in the metadata. So uh, the size of the image is 120 megapixels, and uh, it covers uh, the array of 110 kilometers times 110 kilometers. Of course, we usually don't work with uh, such big areas, or if, if we do, we usually split them to small tiles. So, uh, but for, b before we, 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 will redo, uh, we will clip, clip, to, uh, clip this image, uh, we, uh, we, tr we ask the uh, API again to just get the, uh, finally the RGB preview of the image. Uh, so we ask the APR for the B2 band, B3 band, and B4 band, which are, which are the blue, green, and red spectrum. And uh, the, the Earth Engine API is clever enough to compose a PNG from it, so we uh, don't need to do it ourselves in this case. Uh, you can see that we are sending the whole geometry as the region uh, uh, we want to select from the image, so we, we, are, we, are, we are saying that we want the whole image, and we are also saying that we want to downscale, downscale it to just to picture of 400 pixels to 400 pixels. So that's the result. Voila. So there is the there is the there is the uh, Bratislava in the middle. There is Vienna on the on the left side, uh, and uh, and on the top left corner there is some. A boundary, uh, it's actually a border between the Czech Republic and, uh, and Austria. And so how to select the region from the image? Uh, actually, I, I have, I have, uh, first, uh, first I try to uh, calculate it uh, precisely um, uh, by using some, uh, some conversion between the coordinate systems, but uh, it, it will be too much for this talk. So, uh, so we can, we can uh, simply use uh, Tool uh, such as GeoJSONDB, where you can you can you can draw draw basically the, uh, anything you want, and, uh, and and it will translate to GeoJSON. Uh, so let's uh, let's uh, let's say we just selected uh, let's say we just selected the region manually. If you want, of course, you can you can try to dive in uh, drive into how how to calculate pr some uh, precise error. Uh, precise area, uh, precise region, and uh, again we just preview the, the region in the in the in the widget to see whether it is correct. It seems so. So let's get the RGB preview. So it's basically the same uh, same request as before. We just we just change the re region uh, to this uh, to this small smaller one. So voila, we are we are close. And now, finally, we can we can uh, uh, we are going to load load the GeoTIFF, which is which is georeferenced TIFF with all the bands, and we, we can try to do some stuff with it. Um, uh, for for working with the rest of the rest of data, uh, we usually use the library called Rasterio, which uses the GDAL uh, C library un under the hood, and some other 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 libraries. And uh, so we are going to ask the API again. Uh, it's almost the same query as before, but instead of PNG, we are asking for GeoTIFF, and we are adding one more layer here. Uh, it's, it's the B8, and it's, it's, it's actually a near-infrared spectrum. And uh, once we get the result, we just get the content from the uh, uh, from the response, and we wrap it in the bytes and in a memory file. When actually, when when we are saving, uh, if you save the GeoTIFF, it will be a bit more easier. There is just method raster open, so if you if you have some stored GeoTIFF, it's much easier. So uh, if we have this in memory data, it needs a bit more massaging, but the result is same. You have loaded GeoTIFF in a memory. So as we did before. Let's uh, let's dive into some metadata first. Uh, so we look uh, what the size of the image is, what is the number of bands. So we see uh, the size is what we asked for, uh, and it has the number of bands. Uh, number of bands is four, as we asked for, 
and uh, the, the order of the bands is important in this geotiff because we need to access them uh, through those indexes. So we need to know where, where, which, which uh, that, for example, the B2 is the first one. And uh, you can see that uh, in the, in the geotiff is, uh, uh, contains also the georeferencing information, such as the coordinate reference system and the affine transformation, which is now a bit shifted because uh, uh, the, uh, because the, the region we are displaying is different from the big big image, so this translate x and translate y uh, coordinates are a bit different. But the scale x and scale y is still the ten. Uh, uh, it's still ten. So uh, now we have uh, now we can uh, look uh, how the band uh, par particular band looks. So first. Uh, we load load those pixels uh, with those indexes one two three four, and uh, we just print some what what's to look what what's inside. And as you can see, the band uh, every particular band data is just uh, two uh, D uh, metrics uh, with just with integers, and it's basically just the strength of the of the signal at this particular pixel. And we can we can display it. It's 2D data, so we can just put it to matplotlib and and plot it. So uh, I've added uh, added some color schema to each band to different different uh, differentiate between them. But actually, it will uh, in reality it's just grayscale data. Uh, it ju it's just values, uh, and uh, you can see that the uh, red, green, and blue uh, blue bands are somewhat similar. The, the saturation over the image are, are same, even for I, I've added this uh, this col color to them. Uh, but the near infrared image is quite different. That, for example, on the, in the red uh, the, the red band on the left, the, there are some vegetation parts which are pretty dark. But on the near infrared, it's it's uh, it's the opposite, and uh, we use uh, if you have uh, those uh, spectral differences, uh, you can you can use it uh, for various calculations, and we'll we'll use this uh, use it to lent use detection using two uh, two indexes. One is called NDVI, which means normalized uh, difference vegetation index, and the second one is called norm normalized difference water index, which is ND. Uh, WI, and uh, they they are known for a long time. I think from the 70s or 80s, and uh, they have pretty simple formula. Uh, you are basically just uh, uh, subtracting and dividing uh, the the layers, bit, uh, the the bands, bit, and uh, so let's let's do this. Uh, so as you remember, we loaded loaded all the all the bands into the pixels dictionary, so uh, so we just transfer those formulas to this uh, real computation, which uh, which is, looks almost the same as the uh, symbolic formula with the help of NumPy, which which uh, do, does all the hard work uh, under the hood, and uh, we can display the results uh, uh, with the. Uh, with the good choice of, of some uh, colorization, you can uh, color maps. You can you can see uh, that we are, we have some distant, we have some results. Uh, that on the left we can see some vegetation uh, which is represented by the dark uh, dark green areas, and on the right uh, we can see some uh, like water areas which are represented uh, by the blue uh, dark dark blue colors. Of course, uh, it's just with the choice of the color map, so, and uh, with the threshold, so, uh, of, of course, now you can see uh, that there are some blue blue areas, which are definitely not, not water areas, uh, but the, uh, we, we will, we will uh, solve that with some uh, threshold, uh, just, just one or two cell later. So for uh, for NDVI, it's usually it's usually used threshold 0.3, which is considered to be vegetation, and for NDWI, 
uh, zero, which is considered to be a water. So when we apply, uh, apply uh, those two thresholds, uh, we can get a binary mask. So uh, and and categorize uh, categorize the image. Uh, where is the forest? Where where is the water? And where is uh, something other? Maybe uh, maybe some urban area. So we prepare some uh, some shapes, of, and and we store uh, one uh, for each pixel, which uh, which has the NDVI value value greater than uh, 0.4. It's it's a bit bit more than than the recommended value, but it gave uh, better results for this uh, for this example. And uh, we do the same for the water mask. And when we plot the mask, hooray, we have we have uh, we have detected where is the forest and where is the water. Of course, there are some small glitches which uh, we might need to clean up, or maybe we not if if the analysis doesn't need to be precise enough. And since we know that every pixel has a resolution of 10 times 10 meters, we can uh, we can actually calculate the, the areas for for each category of the land use. So let's load those data into pandas. So we can uh, calculate the total pixels, uh, and then uh, we can just sum because uh, because we said that uh, when when the forest uh, when there is a forest on the pixel. Uh, we we put one. We can just simply sum the masks, and we get the number of the of the pixels. Uh, where is the forest and where is the water? So, with these two simple operations, we get the table, uh, the data frame, and we can we can uh, chart it. So we can see that at this area we have like 22 percent, or almost 23 percent forest, 10 percent water, and uh, 67 7 percent of other era, probably the ur urban era. Uh, so that's it. Uh, that's it for this part. And uh, we can do we can do also. Um, I have a bit more time, so maybe I didn't plan for it, but uh, I can I can uh, show the uh, the next part what you what you uh, what you can do with it. Maybe you want uh, to transfer those masks to uh, to vectors. And with the help of Rasterio, you can also do that. So uh, you uh, you can you can create a shape shape generator, and uh, you 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 fill fill the mask in. Uh, you also put put the Jot, uh, Jotif transform uh, FE matrix uh, there. So, so the results will be georeferenced, and uh, then you can just simply iterate over the shape generator, and it will it will return all the shapes it it, it finds in the in the mask. And now you have you have the same uh, result as before, but now vectorized in a in a shape file format. And now, uh, since we uh, we can we can do some cleanup of those small glitches. So we can we can we can do some uh, classic buffer operations, like uh, like uh, like adding um, subtracting adding buffers, which which uh, which is which is typical trick to clean up uh, clean up some uh, geometries and then also simplify. So and and because this um, uh, the geometry of the image is in meters. Uh, that what we do is actually actually means that we are uh, subtracting five uh, margin of five meters from all the geometries and then adding adding the margin of five uh, five meters back, and it this basically do that all the smaller for example all the smaller polygons which are there are are deleted because uh, when we subtract uh, the margin from them they they got like the zero error and they vanished from the from the geometry. And then we simplify simplify all the coordinates with with the tolerance of uh, half meter. So if there is possibility that uh, the, uh, the there's some optimization or algorithm which can reduce the number of coordinates and simplify the geometry. So uh, here we have the 
uh, here we have the, uh, the river uh, with some small glitches around, but we leave it there. And now we want to uh, display it in a uh, volume as well. But unfortunately, uh, we cannot do it right uh, uh, just like that because this is different. Uh, this is different coordinate system, so we need to convert it. Uh, convert it from the from the co uh, coordinate system of the of the image to the coordinate system of the volume, uh, which is the GPS compatible uh, coordinate system APSG. Uh, 3,326. And uh, we, for that, we use the PyProj uh, library, which is wrapper around the PROJC uh, library, which do all this hard work. And again, we just define the transformation, and then uh, we use Shapely to transform the geometry. And uh, and then finally, we transfer this geometry, which is in shape high format, uh, to GeoJSON. And as a GeoJSON, we can display it finally in a volume. So voila, we have this, uh, uh, we have this river in a, in a vector format now, in a, a displayed in the volume widget. So uh, this is something which you are doing very often in a, uh, when working in imagery that you need to pay attention uh, for the coordinate system, still, uh, and 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 you often often uh, doing several round trips between these uh, coordinate system when you are uh, working on your tasks, and you are taking advantage of each particular coordinate system because, for example, the GPS uh, compatible coordinate system is in uh, is in degrees, while the image uh, while the coordinate system uh, which is used in this image is. Uh, uh, is defined in, in meters. And uh, so basically that's, uh, that's it. Uh, I, aim, I aimed uh, with this, uh, with this uh, notebook or with this technical, uh, or this practical part to give you an idea that you have basically satellite imagery at your fingertips. Uh, you just need to subscribe to Earth Engine, uh, uh, which is free for uh, non-commercial purposes. You just need to create a, a, a Google Cloud pro Platform project, uh, create service account uh, through which you are connecting from this node, for example, from this notebook, and uh, and that's it. And you are you have basically the almost same access as we do as a company uh, to these to these data. And we built a lot of a lot of products on these on these data. Uh, there are in this notebook there are also some ideas for further exploration. If you if you find it interesting, and of course uh, of course we are hiring. So if you find this topic interesting, if you want to do this something like this full time, please look at look at our careers page. There are plenty of jobs, uh, not only programming but also some research uh, or data analyst and and such kind of stuff. So thank you for attention, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> The first question is, do you have any funny stories or any F3 stars, ups, any F ups? I guess that's the question for Matej because he, he is much longer in the company, uh, especially from the early days. <laughs> well, I have a uh, list of stories, but I don't think they're, uh, they're permitted to be told. <laughs> uh, however, I can uh, tell you one, which is that we had a delivery for a customer and uh, we uh, wanted to download imagery from a provider and we started to, uh, to download the data and uh, after a while we've completely wrecked the provider and they had to call the emergency and the guy had to just travel there and turn on all these <laughs> servers that we just shut down completely. So it was small uh, DDoS attack by trying to do a delivery. Thank you for that. And also, uh, there's going to be a meeting, there's going to be a dinner tonight for stories that are under either NDA or just not <laughs> uh, uh, not good to be shared publicly. Uh, those, that is the red <laughs> venue for sharing those. 
and check your emails for, uh, for, for details about that. Okay, another one. When someone, for example, a new developer joins your team, how long is he or she catching up uh, when, when they have no prior experience in that area? Okay, maybe, okay, so maybe that's, that's for me because I joined uh, just a year, year ago. And, and I think, yeah, like you can, there, there are various things you can do uh, at the platform. So for some parts, you don't even know the low, uh, knowledge about this satellite imagery, but I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm, after a year, I, I still, I still learning, and I, maybe I, I still, I still, uh, I'm maybe even forgetting some stuff I, I learned at the beginning because the platform is huge. And uh, but I think I, I start, I start to be productive like within a month or two. So, like, yeah, I think it, it was not, it was not so big, big challenge. Thank you. And the final one. Do you have any data from uh, ultraviolet or higher frequency EM spectra? Well, unfortunately, I don't think we have. I think uh, the closest one was the uh, coastal aerosol that I've shown uh, on the Landsat 7, which is slightly lower than a uh, uh, spectra of uh, blue. So I think that is the closest. Well, if the satellites had the sensor, then I'll go for it. It's interesting topic. Yeah, but maybe if you if you uh, look through the through the imagery, uh, imagery what is available at, at the F engine, I believe there are there are plenty of research data sets. Sorry, uh, I think it's not loading. But if if you go if you go to the F engine uh, uh, F engine catalog of already data sets, I think there are plenty of those data sets like this kind of aerosols and I think. Uwe, uh, ultraviolet light was there as well. Thank you to Vojta and Maciej. Mikrobit je programovateľný milý počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomé. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládať tak, že ňou zatraciem, alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. 
technológie ľudskou rečou.